<clears throat> Good morning. I'm he here once again, and I'm going to continue uh, this excellent work called Days of Rage. And I, I just briefly, before we really start to get into it, um, want to discuss what this book means and why it's important. Um, so in terms of uh, intellectual and moral works, these these types of books, um, this is also one which is in a similar vein as Race War in High School, um, uh, maybe not as timely to that period, um, but it, it's also very interesting because the demystification and the delegitimization of uh, these left-wing movements, which are kind of lionized and who have this sort of air of hippie mystique applied to them, um, this book essentially takes all of that and, and throws it out the window and says, no, look, here are all the firsthand accounts. Here are all the, the interviews with people, even, you know, even several decades past, but now they're, uh, you know, they're willing to talk about things which are very much uh, deep in the past at this point. Um, and I think it's important to remember that the entire class of people, um, all of these people are still in very high places. Um, like the, uh, you know, Bill Ayers and, and, uh, um, what's her name? Um, I can't remember her name now. Um, her, his wife, basically, Bernadine Dorn, yes. Um, yeah, so these people all never did prison time, and or they did very minimal prison time, and not related to the sentences or the crimes which they had actually committed, um, all for procedural stuff, uh, and they all basically admitted their guilt for the procedural things, so went to prison for a very small period. Um, some of the later radicals got put into prison for with extremely stiff sentences. Um, but of course, uh, the most notable ones uh, were given presidential pardons by Clinton. It's another reason why Clinton shouldn't have got elected. But um, anyway, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. All right, so this is chapter one, title, The Revolution Ain't Tomorrow, It's Now. You dig? And this subtitle is Sam Melville and the Birth of the American Underground. Um, this is in New York City in August of 1969. And the really these these sorts this book is written as like a crime procedural, right? I am a huge fan of crime procedurals, or at least I used to be in my younger years. Um, and that's exactly how it's written, and that's exactly how it reads. Um, and and so it's a very fascinating read to, just for that purpose alone. Um, anyway. On a drizzly Friday afternoon, they drove north out of the city in a battered station wagon. Six more shaggy radicals, a baby, and two dogs, heading toward a moment unlike any they had seen. Jimmy. Jonas, the who, the dead. They were like hundreds of thousands of young Americans that season. One part aimless, druggy, and hedonistic. Two parts angry, idealistic, and determined to right all the wrongs they saw in 1969 America. Racism, repression, police brutality, the war... Traffic on the New York State Thruway was slow, but a pipe full of hashish and a few beers left everyone feeling fine. Ten miles from their destination, the car sagged into a traffic jam. One couple got out to walk. The girl, who was 22 that day, 
was Jane Alpert, a petite, bookish honors graduate of Swarthmore College with brunette bangs. She wrote for the Rat Subterranean News, the kind of East Village radical newspaper that established published recipes for Molotov cocktails. Later, friends would describe her as sweet and gentle. The <laughs> sweet and gentle. Yeah. Um, as she stepped from the car, Alpert lifted a copy of Rat to ward off the raindrops. Beside her trudged her 35-year-old lover, Sam Melville, a rangy, broad-chested activist who wore his thinning hair dangling around his shoulders. Melville was a troubled soul, a brooder with a dash of charisma, a man determined to make his mark. Only Jane and a handful of their friends knew how he intended to do it. Only they knew about the dynamite in the refrigerator. Slogging through the rain, they didn't reach the Woodstock Festival until almost midnight. Ducking into a large tent, Jane curled up beside a stranger's air mattress and managed an hour of sleep. She found Melville the next morning, wandering through the movement booths. Manned by hippies and crazies and black panthers and many more. After a long day listening to music, she glimpsed him deep in conversation with one of the crazies, a 30-something character named George Demerol, who could usually be found at New York demonstrations in a crash helmet and purple cape. That George, Melville said as they left, he really is crazy. I offered to spell him at the booth, but he said only bona fide crazies ought to work the official booth. That's because he's old, Jane said. He wants to be a 20-year-old freak. When Melville dropped his head, Jane realized she had offended him. He and Demerol were almost the same age. The echoes of Jimi Hendrix's last solo could still be heard at Woodstock on Monday morning when Jane left the East Village apartment she shared with Melville and walked to work. They had been squabbling all summer and had decided to see other people. That night, though, she canceled a date and returned to the apartment to find him glumly sitting on the bed. I thought you had a date, he said. I changed my mind. Why? Because I'd rather be with you. He said nothing, which was unusual. She lay beside him. What's wrong, Sam? she asked. It took a moment before he said, I planted a bomb this afternoon. The first bombs had already exploded in America, scores of them, and self-styled revolutionaries were already as thick as the air that sweltering August night. But the man who really started it all, who became a patient, a kind of patient zero for the underground groups of the 1970s, was Sam Melville. Until he and his friends began planting bombs around Manhattan in the summer of 1969, Protest bombings had been mostly limited to college campuses. Typically, Molotov cocktails heaved toward ROTC buildings late at night. All but forgotten today, Melville was the first to take anti-government violence to a new level, building large bombs and using them to attack symbols of American power. While later groups would augment his tactics with bank robbery, kidnapping, and murder, Melville's remained the essential blueprint for almost every radical organization of the next decade. <clears throat> ah, good afternoon, Hitman. I see you're here. Good to see you. <clears throat> so this Sam Melville, he was born Samuel Grossman, Grossman, in the Bronx in 1934, making him a decade older than many of his revolutionary peers. In his teens, he adopted the surname Melville after the author of his favorite book, Moby Dick. He had a difficult upbringing. His parents separated before he was five, and he grew up poor in Buffalo. 
he drifted through his 20s, working as a draftsman. By the time he turned 31, he had married and separated and was teaching plumbing at a trade school, aimless and unsatisfied, searching for a purpose to his life. He found it during the Columbia University unrest in 1968, when angry students were occupying campus buildings in protest of discriminatory policies and the Vietnam War. Their cause enthralled Melville, who quit his job on an impulse and took one delivering copies of a radical newspaper, The Guardian. He began dating Jane after selling her a subscription. Jane had grown up in Forest Hills, Queens, and knew next to nothing about Melville's two specialties, radical politics and sex, both of which she found she liked quite a bit. Under his guidance, she became intoxicated by life in the movement. The demonstrations, the sit-ins, the meetings, the sense that the world was changing and she was helping to make it happen. This country is about to go through a revolution, Melville told her. I expect it to happen before the decade is over, and I intend to be a part of it. Jane threw herself into the brave new world of radical politics with a convert's zeal, taking the job at Rat Subterranean News. She and Melville moved in together, renting an apartment on East 11th Street. It was there, amid a hazy tableau of marijuana and movement politics, that she realized Melville's talk of revolution wasn't abstract. He wasn't satisfied with placards and slogans. He wanted to do something, something to bring on the revolution. It was in the fall of 1968 that Melville began to talk about bombs. New York City, he knew, had a long history of bombings. There was the anarchist bombing on Wall Street in 1920, which killed 38 people, and another that killed two policemen at the World's Fair in 1940. But the bomber who obsessed Melville was one he knew from boyhood. George Metesky, the original mad bomber. A disgruntled employee of Consolidated Ellis Edison, Metesky planted 37, excuse me, 33 bombs around Manhattan between 1940 and his arrest in 1957. Two of them exploded at Grand Central Terminal at Pennsylvania Station, at Radio City Music Hall. It's a strange place. And a dozen or more people were injured. After Columbia, Melville began spray-painting buildings with the graffito George Metesky was here. <clears throat> For the moment, bombing was still just an idea. But that winter, as 1968 gave way to 1969... Melville began planning some kind of bombing campaign with his friends. They were all angry. Times were changing, and not for the better. The movement, the great swelling of young Americans that had thronged the streets in protest over the past three years, was crumbling. Everyone sensed it. A new president, Richard Nixon, was entering the White House, pledging to crack down on student radicals. What that meant had become clear at the Democratic National Convention in August, when Chicago police used truncheons to beat down demonstrators, leaving them bloodied, bowed, and defeated. Repression. It was all anyone in the movement talked about that winter. Many were giving up hope. But others, Melville included, began talking about fighting back, about a genuine revolution about guns, about bombs, about guerrilla warfare. Jane privately thought it all ridiculous, brave speechifying fueled by too much free time and too many drugs. And in time, Melville appeared to drop the subject. It was clear, however, that he wanted to do something, and to Jane's amazement, something arrived unannounced that February. In fact, there were two of them, Jean and Jacques. Melville took Jane aside and told her they were genuine revolutionaries, Canadian revolutionaries, dedicated to the freedom of their native Quebec. Their real names were Alain Allard and Jean-Pierre Charette, and their terrorist group, 
Front de Liberation du Québec, known as the FLQ, was responsible for more than 160 acts of violence in Canada, killing at least eight people. Since 1963, including the bombing of the Montreal Stock Exchange just days before, they were on the run. Melville had not only met the two Canadian terrorists through mutual acquaintances, but had agreed to hide them in a friend's apartment. They wanted to get to Cuba. Melville had promised to take care of everything, and for the next few weeks he did. He arranged for a post office box, retrieved their mail, brought them newspapers, even bought their food. In turn, he spent hours closeted with the two, quizzing them on the minutiae of revolutionary work, the ins and outs of safe houses, false papers, and most of all, bombs. Jean and Jacques drew Melville diagrams and showed him how to insert bombs into briefcases. They even tutored him on how to cover his mouth when telephoning in bomb threats. One night, Jane returned to the apartment and found Melville pacing nervously. They've come up with a plan, he said. Jane stared. They want to hijack a plane to Cuba. You're not serious. They were. He was. Even though every nerve in her body told Jane not to, she agreed to help. She did it, she told herself, out of love. The real reason, though she couldn't admit it for years, was the excitement. She was involved in something bigger than herself. They were changing the world. This was justified. This was important. Over the next two weeks, everything came quickly together. Melville managed to buy a gun. Jane selected a Miami-bound plane to hijack. On Monday, May 5th, if they followed the two Canadians to LaGuardia Airport and said goodbye. How can we ever thank you? One asked. We are all fighting for the same cause, Jane replied. That night, Jane and Melville hunched over the radio until the announcer on WBAI read a news bulletin. National Airlines flight number 91 has been diverted from Miami to Cuba, where it has now landed. Melville and Jane shouted for joy, hopping like rabbits. They were so excited. Those little bastards, Melville crowed over and over. They did it. They did it. And there's a footnote. It says, Allard and Charette remained in Cuba for 10 years. Upon their return to Canada in 1979... Both were arrested and served jail terms on old bombing charges. A U.S. effort to extradite the pair was denied in 1991. <clears throat> After the hijacking, Melville's confidence soared. Finally, after months of talk, he began laying concrete plans for the bombing campaign he envisioned. He started practicing with disguises. Jane was startled one day when, lying in the bathtub, she saw a strange man enter the apartment. He looked like a businessman, clean-shaven, wearing a suit and a fedora. It took a moment before she realized it was Melville. We can't afford to look like hippies anymore, he explained. The revolution ain't tomorrow. It's now. You dig? Jane saw her lover's bombing plans as just another of his fantasies. Talk of bombing she dismissed as a Silly scheme, intended to win my attention and boost his self-esteem. Yet Jane's skepticism only seemed to propel Melville forward. One night that June, she found him hunched over a hand-drawn map. That day, he announced, he and a friend had staked out a building site and followed a truck carrying dynamite all the way to the Major Deegan Expressway. Following the truck, he said, would lead to the source of its dynamite. Jane looked at him balefully. Maybe, she suggested, he should try looking in the yellow page under explosives. When he did, Melville was startled to find three listings, including one in the Bronx. All were for a company called Explo Industries. Soon he began talking excitedly about plans to rob the Explo warehouse. Jane rolled her eyes. She might have laughed out loud had she known what Melville also didn't. A short drive north, in much of New England, Dynamite could be purchased by simply walking into any construction supplies retailer. 
<laughs> Imagine. Imagine being able to buy dynamite just over the counter. <laughs> After staking out the warehouse, Melville and two pals made their move on the night of Monday, July 7th, 1969. They left at 11. Jane waited. Midnight came and went. Another hour ticked by. She watched the clock. At 1.20 a.m., Sam and his pals burst into the apartment. Wide smiles on their faces. They plunked down four boxes on the kitchen floor. The robbery had gone smoothly. Once the night watchman saw their guns, he offered no resistance. They left him tied up. Jane gingerly opened the top of one box. Inside was a row upon row of red dynamite sticks, each wrapped in paper. The words nitroglycerin, highly flammable, were printed on each. They took the yogurt and the salad out of the refrigerator and slid the boxes in. Sam was as happy as Jane had ever seen him. Once everyone left, they made love, Alpert wrote later, the most tender and passionate in a long time. The dynamite in the couple's refrigerator quickly became the focus of discussion among their dozen or so radical friends, all of whom, like Melville, were eager to put it to use. A few days after the robbery, Melville rented a $60 a month apartment on East 2nd Street, where they moved the dynamite. The new flat became his clandestine workshop, where he began experimenting with bomb designs. On Saturday, July 26th, the 16th anniversary of Fidel Castro's disastrous raid on the Cuban army barracks, he told Jane he was ready to mark the date with their first action. I mean, $60 a month for an apartment. Jeez. It's like, the minimum now is 600 Yeah. This is just inflation ten times over. <clears throat> Literally, you had inflation ten times <laughs> for in fifty years, sixty years. Their target would be the a United Fruit warehouse on a Hudson River pier in Lower Manhattan. United Fruit, best known for its Chiquita bananas, had been a major investor in Cuba. Melville had already built two bombs and slid them into large vinyl pocketbooks. At dusk, he and Alpert and a friend strolled down to the Hudson, where the warehouse, with the words United Fruit emblazoned on one side, lay in darkness. Standing at the end of the dock, they could see no security, no watchman. The only sound, other than the whiz of cars on the nearby West Side Highway, was the lapping of water below. While the women stood guard, Melville took one of the bombs and disappeared into the gloom. He returned a minute later, took the second bomb, then left again. He hurried back and herded the women away, saying, let's go. They rushed back to their apartment and turned on the radio, eagerly awaiting the news. None came. In the morning, Jane poured over the times. Nothing. They began to suspect that police had covered up the news. That afternoon, they made an anonymous call to WBAI, the radical radio station, and an hour later, it finally carried the news. The two bombs, set beside the warehouse, had blown a hole in an outer wall and wrecked a door. Unfortunately, they learned, United Fruit no longer used the facility. It was being used instead by a tugboat company. Melville was crestfallen. I used up 40 sticks of dynamite on that job, he complained. That's one quarter of what I, we've got. Their friends were furious at being left out of the plan. But that wasn't what delayed their new bombing campaign. Alpert came home from work one evening and found Melville in bed with one of her friends. Afterward, he wanted to break up. Then he changed his mind. They began to fight, then they agreed to try sleeping with other people. Melville was morose. And then came that rainy weekend, they all went up to Woodstock, and then suddenly, sullenly drove back to New York, and Alpert came home from a long day at work, 
and Melville confessed he had planted a new bomb without her. So you're seeing the explanation of the earlier incident. Where did you plant the bomb? Alpert asked. At the Marine Midland Bank. The name meant nothing to Alpert. It wasn't a target they had discussed. It stood at 140 Broadway, a few blocks up from Wall Street. Why Marine Midland? Alpert asked. No particular reason, Melville said. I just walked around Wall Street till I found a likely looking place. It's one of those big new skyscrapers, millions of tons of glass and steel. Some fucking phony sculpture on the front. You just look at the building and the people going in and out of it, and you know. What time did you set the bomb for? Alpert asked. Eleven o'clock. Alpert stared at the clock. Barely an hour away. Sam, you never even cased that building, she said, worried. Do you know what the Wall Street area is like at eleven o'clock on a weeknight? People work there until after midnight. Cleaning women, file clerks, key punch operators. Did you make a warning call or anything? Melville shifted. Alpert all but dragged him to a payphone up the street. She made the call, reaching a security guard. She told him about the bomb and pleaded with him to evacuate the building. The guard seemed annoyed. I'd like to help you, lady. I really would, he said. But I don't leave this post until midnight when I make rounds. But the bomb's going to go off at 11. I see your point, the guard sighed. I'll do what I can. Back in the apartment, Alpert and Melville sat by the radio, waiting. The news came a few minutes after 11. Melville had simply wandered into the building and left the bomb next to an elevator on the 8th floor. That night, about 50 people, almost all women, were working on the floor, inputting data into bookkeeping machines. When the bomb went off at 10.45 p.m., the explosion destroyed several walls, blowing an eight-foot hole in the floor and dumping a ton of debris down into the seventh floor, where more people were working. Windows shattered, generating a blizzard of flying glass. Several women's dresses were cut shreds. Sirens echoed through lower Manhattan. Ambulances carted away 20 people who had been injured, none of them seriously. Alpert was apoplectic. Not because of the injuries, but because of Melville's motivation. The bombing, she saw, had nothing to do with the war or Nixon or racism. She knew Melville better than anyone, and she knew this was about her. As she wrote years later, because I had threatened to abandon him even for even one night by sleeping with another man, he had taken revenge on a skyscraper full of people. Afterward, they drafted a communique which called the bombing an act of political sabotage. Jane typed up three copies and sent them to RAP, the Guardian, and the Liberation News Service. Alpert was actually at RAT when the paper's editor, Jeff Shero, slit open the envelope and read it. Far fucking out, he yelped. Yeah, Hitman. Definitely mass immigration and its consequences. Especially on that rent question. $60 a month. Jesus. For their next bombing, a group of their friends pitched in. On September 18th, 1969, as President Nixon delivered a speech at the United Nations, two miles north, Alpert and the others gathered around Melville as he assembled a bomb. He used 15 sticks of dynamite, a blasting cap, and a West Clock's alarm clock. When he finished, he lowered the device into a handbag Jane had stolen. Wearing a white A-line dress and kid gloves, she slid the bag's strap over her shoulder, gave the group a salute, and left. She took the bus downtown, cushioning the bag on her lap, and got off at Foley Square, home to the U.S. courthouse, with its vast, colonnaded facade. The New York County courthouse, and Alpert's destination, the two-year-old Federal Building, a 42-story rectangle of glass and steel. 
At the elevator bank, Alpert pressed the button for the 40th floor. Reaching it, she stepped into an empty hallway. She left the bomb in an electrical equipment closet. Around 1 a.m., the conspirators gathered on the roof of an apartment house in the East Village. They had trained a telescope on the upper floors of the federal building. All the skyscraper's lights remained ablaze. High atop the building, an airplane beacon blinked its orange eye. They waited, taking turns at the telescope. The minutes ticked by like hours. Then suddenly, a few minutes before two, every light in the federal building silently winked out. Holy shit, someone breathed. An explosion of undetermined origin, the Times called it the next morning, by which time Melville had already learned they had bombed not the Army Department, as planned, but an office suite belonging to the Department of Commerce. The blast had blown a six-foot hole in a wall and a 25-by-40-foot hole in the ceiling, mangling furniture and file cabinets on the floor above. No one had been injured. A few days later, Alpert was walking into the rat offices when she saw police cruisers outside. She stopped at a payphone and called in. An editor said the cops wanted the Marine Midland communique. Alpert killed time in a diner before returning. The cops were gone. But she knew that she and her friends had been sloppy. Too many people were too chatty. Still... She allowed herself to relax when Melville left for a radical gathering in North Dakota. Melville was still away when some of the others, led by a young militant named Jim Duncan, decided they wanted to bomb something too. Of course, Jim Duncan was a pseudonym. Duncan targeted the Selective Service Induction Center on Whitehall Street in Lower Manhattan, the building where every man of age in the borough had to register for the draft. On the night of October 7th, Duncan left his bomb in a 5th floor bathroom. When it detonated at 11.20 p.m., the explosion wrecked the entire floor, scattering debris throughout the building and blowing out windows. No one was injured. The communique, which Duncan wrote himself, was mailed to media outlets across the city. It said the bombing was in support of the North Vietnamese. Legalized marijuana, love, Cuba, legalized abortion, and all the American revolutionaries and GIs who are winning the war against the Pentagon and Nixon. Surrender now. The reaction at RAT, and among everyone they knew in the movement, was joyful. Afterward, Jane and the other planners... Excuse me, afterwards, Jane and the others planned their most ambitious attack to date, a triple bombing aimed squarely at centers of American corporate power. They planned to strike on Monday, November 10th, 1969. The day before, Melville returned, having run out of money. Once he got some, he said, he was going back to North Dakota. He spent the day talking with his pal George DeMerrill of the Crazies, excitedly telling him everything. The two agreed to bomb something together that week. Jane was beside herself. None of them much cared for Demerol. <clears throat> Still, they decided to go ahead. Jane typed up the communique in advance, mailing it to the newspapers. On Monday, they built the bombs. That night, they left them at their targets. The RCA building at Rockefeller Center, the General Motors building at 5th Avenue and 59th Street, and the headquarters of Chase Manhattan Bank. Everything went smoothly. By midnight, everyone had returned to the apartment. Then they phoned in their warnings and waited. The bombs began detonating at 1 a.m. The first exploded on the empty 16th floor of the Chase Manhattan building just as police, reacting to the warning call, finished a fruitless search. The blast ripped through an elevator shaft, sending debris cascading all the way to the street. The bomb on the 20th floor of the RCA building detonated in a vacant office suite, panicking dozens of guests in the Rainbow Room restaurant, 45 floors above. 
men in tuxedos and women in gowns, scurried down a freight elevator and stairwells to the street. The office suite was demolished. Dozens of windows were blown out. The bomb at the General Motors building accomplished much of the same. Once again, the sound of sirens echoed through the streets of Manhattan. Alpert and the others were thrilled. <clears throat> For the police, however, the bombings represented an escalation they could not ignore. This was simply unprecedented. Three bombings in one night. The city had never seen anything like it. The next morning, the NYPD's cigar-trumping chief of detectives, Albert Seedman, Seedman, Sneed, the Sneed, <laughs> um, trumped through, Albert Sneedman trumped through the wreckage, shaking his head and muttering under his breath. His men had been investigating the bombings since the first one at United Fruit and had made no headway whatsoever. He decided to form a special squad of 25 hand-picked detectives to find the perpetrators. Sneedman considered calling the FBI, who he suspected knew more than he did. After the federal building bombing, the head of the Bureau's New York office, a square-drawed veteran named John Malone, had called to say they were working on informant in the case. That morning, as Seedman was establishing his command center at the RCA building, Malone called again. It took a while, Malone said, but the informant finally gave up our man. Who is it? Seedman asked. His name is Sam Melville. <clears throat> Thanks, Corbin. The three explosions ignited in a new kind of civic, <clears throat> civic tumult that would become all but commonplace in New York and other cities in the next decade. A rash of bombings followed by a wave of copycat threats, followed by mass evacuations of skyscraper after skyscraper, leaving thousands of office workers milling about on sidewalks wondering what had happened. That Tuesday, the NYPD was obliged to check out 300 separate bomb threats. The next day, like, just imagine 300 bomb threats in a single day. <laughs> wow. The next day, November 12th, the Associated Press counted 30 just between the hours of 8 a.m. and 1 p.m. A dozen buildings had to be emptied, including the Pan Am building on 45th Street, the Columbia Broadcasting building on 51st Street, and a library in Queens. Afterward, the Times editorialized that periodic evacuation of buildings may become a new lifestyle for the New York office worker. The columnist Sidney Zion noting how powerless the city appeared during a string of bombings now entering its fourth month, said New York was rapidly becoming scare city. Ha ha ha, scare city. <clears throat> Even as Melville and his friends rejoiced that Tuesday, teams of undercover FBI and NYPD men began filtering th into the neighborhood. The next day, Albert Seedman heard from the FBI's John Malone. Our informant says Melville is ready to do another job tonight, Malone said. This time, they plan to place bombs in U.S. Army trucks parked outside a National Guard armory. The trucks will be driven inside late at night, and the bombs will go off a few hours later. Which armory? He didn't say. There were three. Two in Manhattan, one in Queens. We can cover them all, Malone said. In fact, we can ask the army to park plenty of trucks outside each armory. He can have his pick. All that day, Malone and Seedman took reports from the surveillance teams. By mid-afternoon, they believed that Melville was working in his workshop on East 2nd Street. 
Not until it was too late would anyone realize that he wasn't. Melville had left the apartment that morning at eight, ducking out to meet his friend Robin Palmer, who had planned a bombing of his own. It was to be a busy day, Melville's last before returning to North Dakota the next morning. He was determined to go out with a bang, literally, with two separate actions, one with Palmer that evening, the other which with George Demerall later that night. Palmer's target, which he had scouted himself, was the criminal courts building at 100 Center Street, where a group of Black Panthers, the so-called Panther 21, was on trial for an alleged conspiracy to kill New York policemen. That morning, Melville built at least five dynamite bombs. Afterward, they took the subway downtown to the courthouse and slid one behind a plumbing access panel in the fifth in a fifth floor men's room. They were careful. No one noticed. Yeah, Hitman. Bomb threats are apparently just part and parcel living in a big city in the 1970s and 60s. The bomb exploded at 8.35 p.m., demolishing the men's room, leveling a 70-foot terracotta wall and shattering windows. Pipes burst, spilling a river of water through the stairwells. Other than those at a night court trial three floors above, few people were in the building. One woman sitting on a toilet on a floor, a floor below the explosion was blown 15 feet through the air but was unhurt. Albert Seedman took the call while at dinner in Midtown. Roaring downtown in his limousine, he tore the wreckage, broken glass crunching beneath his shoes, so angry he could spit. Melville had done this under their very noses. However, they had all three New York armories under surveillance now, and one last chance to stop him before he struck again. As Seedman simmered, Jane Alpert returned home from work. She found Melville standing in the dark, peering through the window blinds. He put a finger to his lips. They're back, he murmured. You're sure, she asked. Same white car. Same guys. Sam, if you know it's the bomb squad, then don't go out. Stay here until they leave. He gave her a long, lingering hug. I can't stay, he promised. He said, I promised George I'd meet him. Then he kissed her once more, packed up his knapsack, slung it over his shoulder, and left. Inside the bag were four ticking bombs. This time they saw him. An FBI agent atop a neighboring building watched as Melville and George Demerall emerged onto the roof and scrambled across six adjacent rooftops before sliding out a doorway onto East 3rd Street. Melville was wearing an olive drab Air Force uniform, Demerol work pants, and a denim jacket. On the street, they once on the street they split up. FBI agents trailed Melville as he trotted down into the subway. Taking the number six train north, he emerged onto the platform at 23rd Street. Above, two FBI agents and an NYPD detective named Sandy Tice were waiting in a battered blue Chevrolet. They watched as Melville popped out of the subway entrance and strolled east on 23rd. The Chevrolet slowly followed, 50 yards back. At the end of the block, Melville turned left onto Lexington Avenue. Tice got out and followed on foot. It was 9.45 p.m., Keeping well back, Tice followed Melville almost all the way to 26th Street. When he spotted George Demerol lingering on the corner at 25th, presumably serving as a lookout, Tice stepped to one side, studying the menu outside an Armenian restaurant as Melville disappeared into, around the corner onto 26th, heading straight toward the armory where three army trucks were lined up along the curb. A minute ticked by. Demerle remained moored in place. Tice meandered back south block, 
fearing he would be seen. After another minute or so, Melville reappeared on the corner of 26th and Lexington. To Tice's relief, he still had the knapsack slung over his shoulder. A moment later, Demurl followed Melville back down 26th Street. This time, Tice ran forward to follow. When he turned left onto 26th, he was startled to see the two barely 20 feet in front of him. Ahead, on the south side, loomed the enormous red brick armory. The block was nearly empty. Certain he was about to be spotted, Tice looked for cover. Just then, a man in a tight suede suit, walking a tiny Pekingese, strode by. Thinking fast, Tice winked at the man and asked, Sir, can you tell me where a man might find a little action around here? Ahead, Tice could see Melville squatting down beside one of the trucks, digging for something in his knapsack. Before the man with the Pekingese could answer, Tice spotted his two FBI partners, guns drawn, sprinting toward Melville from the far end of the block. Drop it, one yelled as Melville hefted the knapsack. Tice broke into a run. No, no, he shouted. Don't drop it, for Christ's sake. Melville froze. The two FBI agents shoved him and Demerol against one of the trucks as Tice ran up and snatched the canvas bag. He put his ear to it. He heard ticking. Where's the bomb squad? Tice shouted. The FBI men began searching Melville, who made a face. Relax, he said. They're not set to go off until two o'clock. News coverage of Melville's arrest spawned another wave of bomb threats across the New York area the next day, with more than 300 that Friday alone. Dozens of buildings had to be evacuated, including the New York Stock Exchange, Lincoln Center, the General Post Office, the Union Carbide Building, both the New York Times and the Daily News Buildings, the Newsweek Building, the Queen's Criminal Court, the U.S. Army Military Ocean Terminal in Brooklyn, the Susan Wagner High School on Staten Island, and three schools in Great Neck, Long Island. By then, police had already arrested Jane, who joined Melville and George Demerol in jail. All but Melville made bail. Not long after, Demerol was revealed to be the FBI's informant. He had been working for the Bureau since 1966. Melville and Jane's friends in the movement, meanwhile, hailed the couple as heroes. As Jane was led out of court, a crowd of supporters raised fists and shouted, Right on, which the Times identified as a new left, black revolutionary phase of support. The applause continued two weeks later during a rally at Times Square Hotel, where 350 supporters listened as Allen Ginsberg read his poetry and the actress Ultraviolet, Andy Warhol's muse, sang. Now, this is a very interesting detail here about Demerol being uh, the informant. Because remember, this is the, the weirdo guy that nobody really likes, who's always acting crazy. He's a crazy, he's a kook, obviously. He's just, this is the kind of person who's very eccentric and, and really can't be trusted for obvious reasons. <clears throat> Six months later, Jane and Melville pled guilty to conspiracy charges. Melville was sentenced to 13 years on a federal complaint and 18 on state charges. He was sent to the Attica Correctional Facility outside Buffalo, where he wrote a series of letters that were published as a book, Letters from Attica. After the prison erupted in a massive rebellion in September 1971, police characterized Melville as one of the inmate leaders. On September 13th, as state troopers stormed the prison, he was killed in Attica's D yard. State officials claimed he was shot as he prepared to throw a Molotov cocktail. Later, 
lawyers for the inmates insisted he had been murdered. Even before his death, Melville had been an inspiration to many young revolutionaries who dreamed of a war against the U.S. government. He was the first, the trailblazer. In death, he became perhaps their greatest martyr. Jane Alpert, meanwhile, didn't go to prison. Instead, like dozens of other young radicals that spring, she went underground. So you can see the colorful nature of these stories. Um, I really like how this writer, um, he's kind of a journalist, I guess, uh, unfortunately, but um, he he writes very colorfully, I think, and he he always uh, ties up the ending of these little stories together. So he'll, he'll start, he has this habit of starting on one specific person or a, like a group of people. And then he'll, he'll write one single chapter, um, introducing the character, basically going through their development and then, uh, capping it off base uh, with, with some kind of like ending. So he's, he does seem to be a, a competent writer in, in that respect. Um, And of course, you can see um, the usage of informants by the feds. Uh, that I can't stress that enough. Um, it's like this is just a pattern of every single radical movement. You can see that they're always infiltrated by the feds, especially at, at, in the beginning, before they really start to get truly organized and, and start to get truly competent. Um, that's just like seems to be a cost of doing business for any sort of radical radical movement. Yeah, I think one of the the I'm not it's like super big on 1960s history, but I'm sure if you were to talk to a boomer, they probably would be able to to tell you that they remember the the Attica prison riots or or some of these other like events. And it's very interesting because the people in this book um, are all too human in, and they're just everywhere, right? They're, they're always doing stuff. And you can see that the, the push for uh, more rapid and more radical social changes um, is being pushed by these people, basically. It, like, it, it's, it's undeniable, right? And, and all of these little chaotic social events and these little, you know, violent incidents, the, these people are, are who are, are doing it. It's very clear that that's who's happening. Like, I mean, I, from our perspective, I'm, I'm sure that most people would agree that Melville probably wasn't murdered in prison. I'm sure that he probably was doing revolutionary activity in prison because, as we know from any sort of left-wing movement in the 60s, they always, like this... You, and any sort of like coalition of the fringes movement in general, they always make an appeal to the criminal element. And that was, of course, what they were doing. So like, that's just frankly bullshit. That this massively radical guy who's like a radicals radical, the first one to, to the, you know, the fight basically to, to perform violent acts, um, at least in their circles, it doesn't make any sense that he, you know, wouldn't be uh, starting trouble in prison. You know, yeah, oh, totally innocent, totally innocent. Yeah, sure. Well, that's going to wrap it up for this chapter. We're closing in on almost an hour here. Um, the next chapter will be Negroes with Guns, Black Rage and the Road to Revolution, which is a, a very nice chapter, I think, because you start getting into uh, a lot more of the... Uh, um, the Black Radicals, which are very interesting. Uh, I, I think um, Radical Liberation talked about the Black Radicals uh, once on his extremely long series on leftist violence. But anyway, uh, so that'll do it for now. Um, hopefully I can do more of these streams. I have a little bit more time because... Uh, 
uh, I'm not uh, doing so much work right now um, in terms of uh, like school and etc. So, uh, and I, I kind of want to get other people on to do react to this in, in more Pete Canina style. I just I woke up this morning and and decided to to do it. You know, um, I felt the inspiration to to just read the book and and get the information out there. If you guys continue listening to the series, you'll you'll deeply understand why this book is so important because there's a lot of things in it, um, and I can't stress this enough uh, that are just these little little patterns, little uh, commonalities that people in our circles uh, seem to have with these people, um, just because of like personality and ideology ideological conflicts um, on that level, and then um, the you know the concern about the Fed, you know, infiltration, and then, um, and then all of these like little tactics where you know, these these field craft things that probably still are still applicable and still get used. So it, it's just just one of these things where you're like, hmm, how do they actually do that? And uh, the understanding of a field craft it, and and to be able to counter our opponents on the left is something that is, you know, absolutely critical. So, um, thanks for all for stopping by. Uh, appreciate it. And, uh, if you guys have any questions, let me know. I can hang out for a couple more minutes. <clears throat> Yeah, good to see you again, Corbin. It's nice. It's nice that you're here. One of my channel's regulars. I don't want to start chapter two today. Um, it's a fairly long chapter, um, and just because there's a lot of of people. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, of stuff going on and a lot of characters that have to be introduced and, and why these people got involved. And it, it like, I, I kind of want to keep these chapters very, very split apart. Right? I don't want them to, to roll together. Uh, like I, I did the, the, the cast of characters in the prologue together because that was like less than 10 pages, basically. Um, so, you know. Uh, that and so it's just interesting to have that as a teaser. Um, <clears throat> yep, no problem, Hitman. Uh, thanks for showing up. Uh, I imagine it's uh, probably fairly late over there in Old Blighty, so um, thanks for stopping by before you uh, head off to bed, I guess. <laughs> I think I'll leave it there. So, uh, <clears throat> have a wonderful rest of your day, folks. <clears throat>